Mr. President, I listened to the statement of my colleague and friend from Texas, Senator Cornyn, on the issue of immigration. It would seem that we're miles apart, Democrats and Republicans, on this issue. Let me state from my own personal point of view, speaking just for myself, what I think we're facing and what we should do to address it. Here are the basics, as far as I'm concerned. We need an orderly process for immigration in America, both at the border and off the border. That, mean law, that means laws and rules, numbers that work for both the immigrants as well as the economy of America. Number two, we should never knowingly allow anyone dangerous to come into this country or if they are here in immigrant status and pose a danger to our country, they have no right to stay as far as I'm concerned. Number three, it's a great compliment that so many people all over the world are desperate to come to our country. If the opposite were true and people were flowing out of the United States, it would be a sad commentary. But America has always been a magnet of opportunity. And so the fact that so many people want to come here is a compliment in a way. But the reality is this. We cannot absorb everyone who wants to come into America from all over the world in, in, in a limited period of time. It can only be considered in an orderly fashion over a longer period of time. Number four, we haven't touched this immigration set of laws in 30 years. So to blame Joe Biden for this is to ignore the obvious. There wasn't much, if anything, done under the Trump administration that was helpful. And going back years and years before, very little, if anything, to show for it. The only time we finally did a bipartisan bill and brought it to the floor of the United States Senate, I was part of the gang of eight. We brought it to the floor. We debated it at length in the committee and on the floor. And it passed with a vote, I believe, of 65 here in the United States Senate, bipartisan vote, sent over to the House of Representatives, which is under Republican control with Speaker Ryan. They never raised the issue. They never brought it to the floor. They never discussed it in committee. So that was the end of the effort. So to argue that we haven't tried, we have. On various individual bills, like the DREAM Act, which I introduced 21 years ago, I brought it to the floor of the Senate five times and got a majority vote all five times. But that's not enough in the Senate. It didn't get 60 votes. And so we lost the bill to a filibuster each and every time. So to argue that the effort has not been undertaken is not quite accurate. The question is, where do we go from here? Title 48 was basically a public health announcement that we could deny access to the United States to people based on public health considerations. This week, a DC judge, federal judge, concluded that whatever our initial rationale was for Title 48, it no longer applied. If it was for COVID-19 or public health, he found reason to question whether or not, in today's circumstances, it still applied. Why is this important? 40 to 50% of those who come to the border are turned away under Title 48. So the Border Patrol is saying to us, what's going to happen when this expires? We'll have even more people seeking entry into the United States and no basis for turning them away. So it's a situation which is a real and challenging situation. And I think it argues more than ever that we have to do something and do it soon so that the situation at the border does not get worse. Why is it so bad? Well, there are a variety of circumstances that have uh, given rise to this situation, not the least of which is the countries that are sending the most people to the United States include Venezuela, where millions have fled Venezuela and the dictator that's running that country to neighboring countries and now are coming to the United States. Venezuela is not a government, does not have a government that we are in regular communication with. And so it's not a matter of working out our differences to slow down this flow of immigration. Our State Department notifies American citizens not to travel to Venezuela because it's too dangerous. So when Venezuelans come to our border and say we are fleeing persecution and danger in our country, we've recognized that as a fact through the State Department directives. It is a dangerous country. I've been there. 
I have a general feeling about how dangerous it is. So the situation is not easily resolved. Let me say to the senator from Texas, he said he's ready to sit down. I am too. We need to sit down. He, a Republican, myself as a Democrat, and find some common ground. There are some things which we can come to an agreement on. First, when it comes to fentanyl and drugs, overwhelmingly by a margin of six to one, drugs are flowing into the United States under regular ports of entry. It isn't a matter of some young person with a backpack full of heroin or fentanyl coming across the border in the middle of the night, so much as it is truckloads coming through the escape detection. That's inexcusable. Do you want to vote for more security, more technology, stopping the drugs coming in from the border? Count me in. It's not just a Republican platform. It's a Democratic platform as well. We're suffering from a drug crisis in my state of Illinois just as much as the state of Texas, maybe more in some circumstances. So count me in for more security. Do you believe that it's too long between a person arriving in the United States uh, and giving, being given a court date before they finally do appear? I'm for changing that too. We need more immigration courts. We need more judges in those courts. I'll vote for the money to see that happen. What are we going to do in terms of uh, people who come into this country? Are they needed? Well, they're desperately needed. Just recently, the government, governors of Texas and Arizona and Florida decided to uh, pull a political stunt, and I call it a stunt, of sending people who had just crossed the border on buses to communities around the United States. These people got on the buses believing that at the end of the path, at the end of their trip, they would be taken care of. Jobs and houses, all sorts of things were promised to them. None of it was true. They were misled into getting on those buses. How do I know that? Because I sat down with them. In Chicago, 4,000 or more have already arrived. And I heard their stories. And when you listen to their stories, you understand the fundamentals of this decision. Carlos came with his wife and his five-year-old daughter and his little baby infant. His uh, wife was nursing. He left Venezuela on May 5th. It took him five months to finally make it to our border. And when he got there, he was in a circumstance where everything had happened to him. He had been robbed, beaten, and his cell phone taken away, and he thought he was going to die under the circumstances. He was so desperate to come to the United States and escape Venezuela, he trekked on, carrying both babies at one point because his wife had hurt her leg. That kind of determination belies the argument that these people are trying to swindle our system. They are as desperate as many of our parents and grandparents to come and find freedom and opportunity. It's a natural human instinct. It says to me that they are being exploited, I'm sure, by smugglers and others and coyotes who try to bring them to our border, who charge them exorbitant amounts of money and often abandon them in flight. But the fact of the matter is, the push factor is dramatic, and we have got to deal with it. Now, what the administration has said is that they are going to allow a certain number of Venezuelans to legally enter the United States as long as they have sponsors in our country. Uh, 24,000 is the number that they gave. I think that's the beginning of talking about the legitimate needs of America for workers. Many of these people coming off the buses in Chicago were offered jobs right on the spot. We have so many uh, vacancies in, in employment right now. But we've got to do this in an orderly fashion. That's one of the points that I made earlier. And I'd like to say a word about the DREAM Act, and I see my other colleagues on the floor who are seeking recognition. Yesterday, we had a rally for people who were protected by DACA. I introduced the DREAM Act 21 years ago when we couldn't pass it because of the filibuster on the floor of the Senate. I appealed to President Obama, who created DACA, which allowed people young people brought here as children and infants to apply for two years of protection so they could work and not be deported in the United States called DACA. Well, there's six to 800,000 who have qualified for that. They've, they've frozen their numbers over the last several years, but those are the ones who were in place at the time. They showed up a lot of them yesterday. One woman said to me, I'm DACA and I'm also 40 years old. Senator, is this ever gonna be resolved? It's a legitimate question. So many of them are teachers and nurses and doctors and members of our military who are doing their best in essential work uh, occupations. 
that deserve an opportunity to be in this country. And there is a feeling that some court could pull the rug out from under them in a matter of hours or days. So we need to act on that quickly. I'm going to submit for the record the statement that I was going to make on the uh, Ukraine situation. But I rose to respond to my friend from Texas. I accept his challenge. Let's sit down on a bipartisan basis, on a timely bipartisan basis, the Monday we return from Thanksgiving, and start the conversation. I'm willing to talk honestly about border security, and I'm sure he is willing to talk honestly about DACA and DREAMers and the critical needs of people who are coming into the United States. I yield the floor.